visit in Jeremiah that your word became like a fire in my heart that was shut up in my bones, Lord. And when you shut a fire up in something, it, it radiates heat, Lord. And help the word that you gave me this morning to radiate out of me, out of my mouth, and into the ears of the people that need to hear it, Lord. Thank you for your touch. Thank you for your goodness and mercy. And all the good things that every person that's here this morning can tell us all to be doing what you want us to be and nothing else, Lord. In Jesus' name, pray, amen. Amen. We're going to get started over in, in Genesis this morning. Green said something that goes right along with their lesson this morning. You said that we can see things the way that God sees it. Here you go. If we can see things the way that, that God sees them. You know, we've all heard that saying that, that hindsight is 20 and, and in your life, if you look back right now, you'll say, if I don't only know. Oh, yeah. But what about spiritual if I'd only known that this would have happened in my spiritual life, I could have changed so much. Well, what if we could start today and look forward and have the same kind of vision in the future that we see in the past? What if God somehow could open our spiritual eyes? What if we could see things the way that God sees them? In our life. I studied quite a bit on this yesterday. I actually had a whole other different lesson that was uh, seven points long. And, and for some reason yesterday the Lord changed it to this. But he knew what he was doing. We're going to be in Genesis 21 to start with. And, and hopefully... As we study through this, I want us to see that God does have the power if we've got the faith to open our spiritual eyes. To let us see the things that he wants us to see. And when we see that, it changes not only our spiritual outlook, the look that we have toward the future, but it also changes our physical look toward the future. Genesis chapter 21, we're going to start at verse 14. This is going to be the story of Hagar and uh, Ishmael. And at this point, we know all of the story. Sarah had Abraham have a child with his handmaid. But at this point in life, he's grown up a little bit and they've had Isaac. And she's become jealous and says to Abraham, get rid of her. We don't need her here no more. I don't want her here no more. Ishmael is making fun of Isaac. And she began jealous and, and told him to make her leave. And, and the word says that Abraham hearkened unto the word of Sarah. It's, Abraham did not want to send them out. Abraham loved Ishmael. Ishmael really was his first son, but not with his wife. Uh, chapter 21, verse 14, And Abraham rose early in the morning and took bread and a bottle of water and gave it to Hagar, putting it in her shoulder and the child and sent her away. And she departed and wandered in the wilderness of Beersheba. This is actually what it is. And the water was spent in the bottle and she cast the child under the shrubs and she went and sat her down over against him a good ways off as it were a bow shot. For she said, let me not see the death of the child. And she sat over against him and lifted up her voice and wept. And God heard the voice of the lad and the angel of God called to Hagar from heaven and said to her, What aileth thee, Hagar? Fear not, for God hath heard the voice of the child where he is. Arise, lift up the lad, and hold him in thy hand, for I will make him a great nation. Listen here. And God opened her eyes, and she saw a well of water, and she went and filled the bottle with water and gave the lad a drink. 
And God was with the lad, and he grew as well in the wilderness and became an archer. Now, if you look back, there's a promise made to Abraham concerning the Ishmael. And he promises Abraham that he's going to make him a great nation. But just like in our lives, the flesh became involved. And Abraham and Sarah sent Ishmael away. Okay, looking through man's eyes, that would void God's promise. Because in reality, they should have died in the desert. But God has promised people. I want you to look. Verse 18. Arise and lift up the lad and hold him in thine hand, for I will make him a great nation. So God reinforced his promise there. Yeah. And God opened her eyes. So now, somebody tell me, give me an example of when God opened your eyes. Okay, do we believe that this can happen? Sure, sure. Why has not one person in here got an example of it happening? Well, it's happened to me because it's my faith and my fear. And now I can actually lay that down and I can trust God. Because He already has a plan. And I can see it. <laughs> and when I'm blind by fear, I can't trust Him. That's right. Okay, trust is the key word there. When we trust God to show us something, He will show it to us. Yes. But sometimes we refuse to trust God to show us what His will is in our life. Why? Like anybody would for water. 
to the point that Hagar puts him under a little tree and goes off. And, and her exact words are, I can't watch him die. I don't want to watch my son die. Now, Miss Janice asked prayer for her son, Tom. I know Tom. And imagine having your son in prison, having your son in a addiction, having your son in a, just a state of rebellion, having your daughter in, in something that you can't stand to see again, maybe living in adultery or fornication or something like that, okay? There comes a point in a parent's life where they have to distance themselves from that child because they can't stand to see what they're doing to the child. Amen. And if you think about this, this is exactly what God showed us through this word. I'm going to hide the child under the tree and go off because I can't stand to see what's happening in their life. But God provided a way, didn't he? But she had to have her eyes open. stand to watch him die. She said she knew in her heart that's what was going to happen to him up. But now look at uh, verse 17. And God heard the voice and I have never noticed this until yesterday. And God heard the voice of the lad. And the angel of God called to Hagar out of heaven and said unto her what aileth thee? Fear not, for God hath heard the voice of the lad underline his next word where he is. So did you know, if you put your child, if you put the situation that God has somehow saw you in, under the bush, and you go off, imagine that child just for a minute. They're crying loud. God can hear their cry no matter where they're at. Be it in prison, be it in addiction, be it in fornication, be it in rebellion, no matter what, wherever that child is, God can hear that cry. God chose to move in this situation. But look who he spoke to. And God heard the voice of the lad, and the angel of God called to Hagar. Is that not amazing? Yeah. He heard the cry of the child, but he spoke to the parent. And then he opened her eyes. When God opens your eyes, you will see God's provision. As soon as he opened her eyes, she saw the water. She saw the neat field in her son's life. And sometimes, that's all it takes. We just need a spiritual eye. God heard the cries of the child in the desert. God called the Hagar, Hagar, the loving mother of the child, out of heaven. And then he said, I heard the voice of the child while he was in church, right? He was close to death. He was in a pitiful shape. I've heard the voice of that child where he is. So, what's God's promise concerning our children? Proverbs 22, 6, what does it say? Train up. Nobody in here can quote it. Somebody say it out loud. Train up the child in the way he should go, and in his old age, what will happen? He will not depart from it. So we bring up our children. They fall into the rebellion. They move away from us. We have to distance ourselves from them. But God still hears the cry. Did you know that God made Ishmael a great nation? Did you know that the world is still dealing with Ishmael whites today? Amen. Did you know that when God hears that cry, He still brings His promise out of their life? And when they get to the point that they'll cry out to God, He can bring the promise, bring up the child in the way that they should go, and they will not depart from it. That's a promise that I'm claiming for my child. Uh, I've used this example before, but I work with Phil, and he tells me once a week, he said, I read it for you when your daughter got into high school. It changes me. He said, It changed my daughter. He talks about the changes that she went through and the ones that she still deals with. And it bothered me so bad. And I worried and worried and worried and I worried and I worried about it. It 
terrified me to her to high school. And if you think about it, there's a lot of liberal stuff that goes on. The, and the higher they get in level of the school, the more liberal stuff they're going to be exposed to. It terrified me. And just got changed one day. Meredith Rourke that sits right over there, I bumped into him at the garage one day. And he said, you know, you're talking about sending your daughter to high school and stuff, and his daughter's grown and went on to college and has a job and is married now. I said, yeah, I said, it terrified me. And he said, you know, you brought your child up in church. And I know that that guy that you're talking about, his daughter went into this liberal lifestyle, and he never took her to church. He don't go to the church to sit. He said, you put a filter in her life. You see, you know that she sees you read your Bible. She sees you study. She sees you pray. She, you bring her to church. And that's the thing that's going to change her. She's going to recognize these liberal ideas that are put in front of her through the filter that she put in front of her. And I truly believe that God sent him in my life to encourage me and discern me. And I believe that God can carry his promise through that says that she will never depart from the things that she's been taught because she was taught at a young age. It's the only hope our children are going to have. You know, we talk about that uh, that hindsight is twenty twenty, and you know, it's the way that God works sometimes never ceases to amaze me. See, Meredith had the job that I've got now, he retired from her, that I've never made before. And uh, I went there and ended up getting the job, and he came up there one day and introduced himself. And I don't know, maybe three or four months later, I looked and he was sitting here in church. And somehow God worked that out through that job, and now we go to church together, and, and he's an encouragement, and I kind of looked up to him because he's got his daughter raised up, he's a successful man, and as you know, a 43-year-old man, we got to look forward to things that we see these men of God do. Amen. And I hope that the younger guys in this church can look at me and Eric and Alan and, and say, I want to be like that someday. Amen. But somehow, I couldn't see that before, but God opened my eyes looking back. Well, I think sometimes we have to go through those things, Kevin, and I think it's
Hindsight 2020. Spiritual hindsight 2020. So when we look into the future, we need to have that spiritual 2020 vision. Okay, God works things out. He promised to make uh, Ishmael a great nation, and that's exactly what he done. During the time that he was in the wilderness, he was hopeless. He was in the worst place that you could possibly imagine. God heard the cry of Ishmael, and he spoke to his mother. Okay, another good example. Number one was, you will see God's provision. Turn over to Numbers chapter 22.
the donkey saw were looking. Verse 26, And God's anger was kindled because he went, and the angel of the Lord stood in the way for an adversary against him. When your spiritual eyes are open, it will give you direction. Now at this time, the donkey's spiritual eyes were open. Balaam could not see the angel. He could not see death right in front of him. But God opened the eyes of the donkey, and he could see it. Balaam knew what he was doing was wrong, but he was going to do it anyhow. Now somebody tell me why he was going to do it. good God is concerning this. Look at verse 23. And the donkey saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way with his sword drawn in his hand. And the donkey turned aside out of the way and went into the field. And Balaam smote the donkey to turn her back into the way. God is so good that when we get in our car and head in the direction that we know that we're not supposed to go, to do the things that we know that we're not supposed to do, he will provide a way, a place for us to turn around. Now he provided Balaam and this donkey a big old field to turn around and go back where they came from. He'd done that for a reason. He wanted Balaam to turn from what he was doing. And that's exactly what he does for us. We have to have our spiritual eyes open and realize that when God provides us a place to turn around and go back, Good. that there's danger in it. But Balaam, he's money driven, right? He's not going to give up that easy. Look at verse 25. And when the donkey saw the angel of the Lord, she thrust herself against the wall and crushed Balaam's foot against the wall, and he smote her again. He's going to beat that donkey until she goes where he wants her to go. So he's not giving up, but the donkey's not, and God's not either. So God gave this corrupt prophet a wake-up call. He crushed his foot against the wall of that thing. And sometimes we get a wake-up call. Absolutely. I've been on my way to places I shouldn't be, to do things I shouldn't be doing, and I've had my foot crushed against the wall before. God said, you're not supposed to be there. Your car broke down, we couldn't get fixed that time, right? Yep, broke my ankle the week before. Yep, there you go. It falls right in place, don't it? So the donkey crushed his foot against the wall. And Balaam, all the time, is beating this poor donkey with a stick. And this story, if this don't prove that God's got a sense of humor, nothing else in the Bible can. <laughs> now, I want you to look real close at where this goes. Now, look at verse 28. And the Lord opened the mouth of the donkey, and she said to Balaam, smitten me these three, th three times. And Balaam said unto the donkey. Now this man is having a conversation with this donkey and don't even realize that he's doing it. We do that. We do, don't we? Now I know your wife looked over and laughed at you when we were talking about this. Yeah. And I bet she was thinking, I'm the donkey. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly right. <laughs> Well, that's the thing about the donkey talking back. And the thing about it is, when you look over at him and he says, I'm the donkey, you have conversations with him. So if you can speak donkey, what does that mean? Yeah. It means you both might have stuff in church, right? <laughs> and Balaam said unto the donkey, Because thou hast mocked me, I would, if I had to have a sword, I would kill thee. For now, I would kill thee. That's his exact, exact word. And the donkey said to Balaam, Have I not been faithful to you? Let's move on down. And the Lord opened the eyes of Balaam, and he saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way, with his sword drawn in his hand. And he bowed down his face, and the angel of the Lord said unto him, Wherefore hast thou smitten the donkey these three times? Behold, I went out to stand before thee, because thy way is perverted. Now listen. God was going to put a stop to him going to put this curse on these people any way it fits. He had the option to turn around. He had the option to learn his lesson. Or he had the option to die. God will give you direction through your spiritual vision. Good. And you still have the same options that they don't have here. Good word. 
Yeah. He had it went just a few steps farther away because that's what happened. <coughs> there was a reason that angel was standing there with the sword drawn. God was not going to let his people be cursed. Okay, what time is it? Let's move on to uh, Luke. Verse 14. And this is going to be the story of Elisha and his servant who are surrounded by a huge army. 2 Kings chapter 6, verse 14. Therefore sent he thither horses and chariots and great hosts that they came by night and compassed the city about. And when the servant of the man of God had risen early and gone forth, behold, a host and passed the city, both with horses and chariots, and his servant said unto them, Alas, master, how shall we do? And he answered, Fear not, for they that be with us are more than they that be with them. And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, a dry mouth, and he saw. And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots fire around about Elisha. And when they came down, let's stop right there just for a minute. Okay, the next thing that having your spiritual eyes open will do, number one, it will show you God's defense in your life. Did you know that the Word of God says that there's more things going on around us spiritually than the things that we can see physically? Did you know that there's demons following you to church? There's demons watch you sleep last night. There's demons that have traps set for you in the future. And did you know that God's defense is the only thing that keeps you out of this right. these things that are after you? When God opens your eyes, you can see the defenses that He has around about you. Now I'm going to ask you once again. Hindsight's 2020. Look back through your life and you'll see how many times God's defended you. Until you have your spiritual eyes open. Cannot recognize this. Just as many traps are set for you, for everyone, God sends a, a defense of some kind in your life to keep you out of it. Not only that, but you, when you have your spiritual eyes open, God will show you His offerings that He has in your life. Now, He had already prepared these fiery horses and chariots to protect the city and Elisha and the servant, right? But he wasn't just going to protect them. Read verse 18. And when they came down to, to him, Elisha prayed unto the Lord. Now listen to this. He's just now prayed that the eyes of the servant will be open. And when they came down to him, Elisha prayed unto the Lord and said, Smite the people, I pray thee, with blindness. So not only did he pray that the eyes of the servant would be open, he prayed that the eyes of the enemy would be closed. And guess what happened? God closed the eyes of the enemy. And it says, well, let's just read it. 19. And Elisha said unto them, This is not the way, neither is this the city. Follow me, and I will bring you to the man whom you see. And he led them to Samaria. That tells me that he probably tied a string to each one of them. He got in front of them and led them to the place where God wanted them to be. Now, this is his enemy. They were blinded, they were totally blinded. And Elisha had to lead him by the hand where he wanted him to go. And God had all that prepared out. And when, as soon as the servant had his spiritual eyes open, all this came to pass. Not only does he prepare defense in your life, he has a strong offering. And he knows how to take care of your enemy. And once again, 
Look back through your life. You'll see the offense that God provided again and again and again for the things that would have killed you if he could have. Okay, so we've got provision. We've got offense and defense. We've got protection. Now let's turn over to Luke right quick. Luke chapter 24. I'm going to start in verse 13. This is after the crucifixion, after the, uh, the disciples have all been scattered. This is the lowest time in these men's lives. And they, at this point in their life, need their eyes open up. They need to see spiritually. Uh, Luke chapter 24, verse 13. And behold, two of them went that same day to the village called Emmaus, which was from Jerusalem, about three score furlongs. And they talked together about all these things which had happened. And it came to pass that while they communed together and reasoned that Jesus himself drew near and went with them. And their eyes were open that they should not know them. And he said unto them, What manner of communications are these that you have one to another as you walk? And I love this part right here. And why are you so sad? And one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered and said unto them, Art thou only a stranger in Jerusalem, that thou not known the things which are come to pass that are in these days? And he said unto them, What thing? And they said unto him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, which was a prophet, mighty indeed, and in word before God and all the people, and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death, and, we have, and they had crucified him. But we trusted that it had been he which should have redeemed Israel, and beside all this, today is the third day since these things were done. Yea, and certain women also of our company made us astonished, which were early in the sepulchre. And when they found not his body, they came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels, which, saying, which said that he was alive. And certain of them, which were with us in the sepulchre, went into the sepulchre and found it even so as the women had said. But him they saw not. Then he said unto them, O fools and slow of heart to believe, all that the prophets have spoken, all my Christ, to have suffered these things to enter into his glory. And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them all the scriptures and the things concerning himself. And they drew nigh to the village, whither they went, and he made as though he would have gone further. And they constrained him, saying, Abide with us, for it is toward evening, and this day is far spent. And he went in to carry with them. And it came to pass, as he said, that meat with them, and took bread, and blessed it, and break it, and gave to them. Look right here. And their eyes were open, and they knew him, and he vanished out of their sight. And they said one to another, Did our, not, did our hearts not burn within us while we talked to us on the way, and while he opened the scriptures to us? And they rose up the same hour, and returned to Jerusalem, to Jerusalem and found the eleven gathered together, and then that were with him, saying, The Lord has risen indeed, and hath appeared to Simon. And they told the things which were done in the way, and how he was known unto them at the breaking of bread. The last thing that we got today that we're going to go through, when your spiritual eyes are open, it will give you comfort. Amen. And if you look real close, it says that Jesus expounded the word to them. And the comfort that is going to be given to you when your spiritual eyes are open. Come to this. It can come from no other place. When the problem comes in your life, the word is what's going to push you back. When you need defense, you get it out of here. When you need offense, you get it out of here. When you need provision, when you need protection, the things that you need, all the promises that were given to the child, to the woman, are in here. And you have to be able to open this up in your heart. And pull it out of there. And get that comfort.